Hey guys, welcome back to the ProtoWatch series that we have on the Solid State Gamer. It's a little series that I do where I take a look at games in their developmental stages and pretty much point out differences between these versions and their final release counterparts. Or if they're canceled versions of games, I kind of just check out the nuances and the different gameplay features and kind of point out the assets, the aesthetic touches to the game, and just anything I find interesting. I'm your host, John Rivera, as always, host of the ROMcast and lead reviewer for the Solid State Gamer, bringing you guys an interesting installment in this series. This is actually a cancelled sequel to a game that I've actually covered to a certain extent on the website. I've done a full review of this game, and I've also done a quick look video on it if you guys are familiar with it. The game is Zero Tolerance for the Sega Genesis. This is actually an exclusive sequel to that Genesis hit or sleeper hit. It wasn't really a popular game because it came out so late in the system's lifespan. This game was supposed to come out a year after Zero Tolerance, so this would have been 1995. Possibly late 1995, in time for the holiday season. However, the company disbanded at some point and this game was cancelled. This is a very interesting prototype because it's surprisingly very playable but at the same time, there are some elements in it that kind of inhibit the playability of it. And I'll go into more detail about that, of course. But just to start, let's go into the options. As you can see, the password system, if you guys are familiar with Zero Tolerance or have seen my quick look video on it, you've seen it all the way through, you'll notice that a few things are the same. For example, a password feature, and surprisingly enough, the multiplayer mode is in this game. For those of you guys who are not familiar with this, in Zero Tolerance, it is the only game for the Sega Genesis that supported local network-based multiplayer. I guess it was more of a serial connection uh, sort of deal, where you could actually connect two Genesis systems. If you had two copies of the game, two systems, two TVs, and all the other hookups to make it work, plus this link cable, which is a proprietary one, that you could send in with a little mail voucher to get. It did not come with the game. If you got this all set up, you could actually play local area network multiplayer on the Sega Genesis. Now, truth be told, in terms of final releases, this the first Zero Tolerance is the only game that this works on. But, theoretically, and I have not tested this out, mind you, but theoretically, if I were to get two EverDrive cartridges for the Genesis and put the ROM for this title on them and with the same setup that I've done with multiplayer zero tolerance on the Genesis theoretically I should be able to play multiplayer beyond zero tolerance and play co-op or play competitively if that's my if that's my style However, like I said, I don't have the resources to do it. The only thing I'm missing is the two EverDrive cartridges, and those are kind of expensive, so maybe sometime in the future I'll actually cover that. But as for now, I'm just going to go single player with this. I would love to revisit it, uh, this title and, and experiment with some multiplayer and possibly do a video on the first Zero Tolerance. So. According to the title screen, this build is actually in its alpha stage and its version number is 062395A. So, which makes sense because this game, I've since played it, I haven't played it through, but I've played a great deal of it. It's, mm, it's too far away from a finished work. In my estimation, I would say that this game is roughly 60% complete. There's been a huge overhaul with some with certain concepts that were implemented in the first Zero Tolerance that were changed or improved upon in this version. And just like the first one, you had that exposition cutscene right there, just a static screen. That actual object that you saw in the sky was the alien mothership or something to that effect. And basically the crux of the story is that this new Zero Tolerance team, which is, from what I understand, a five-man squad, yeah, is sent to infiltrate the mothership and pretty much decimate the alien forces. 
So, like the first Zero Tolerance, Beyond Zero Tolerance has a multi-ethnic cast. Which, again, it, it was an interesting feature for the time, or inclusion, because most other FPS games just had white male protagonists. So, it's interesting to see this, this change being done. So, I'm going to select this guy because he's the marksman. Which is ironic, because he arrives unarmed. So... So we're going to pick up the flashlight, and that leads me to access the inventory screen or map screen. They made a couple of cool changes. Now, first of all, you can see at the bottom hand area of the screen, it says not secured. This is actually part of the password feature that is a carryover from the first zero tolerance. If you clear out uh, a room full of enemies and you bring the, en the enemy counter down to zero, you will then be awarded a password which you can use to access that level once again you know after turning the power off and leaving that game session behind because there's no battery backup save feature in this game the only way it works is with path passwords and the only way you get a password is by clearing a room of enemies completely so that's uh, that that's a feature that is still in this game also you'll notice I'm actually moving around the map instead of just a huge like graphic of someone someone's hands holding a map and not being able to actually navigate the map you can actually scroll through this map that automatically I guess updates and refreshes as you explore more areas of the level something I don't like about this is that the mini map that you have on the gameplay screen right here in the middle of the bottom section next to the ID card if you if you notice, I'm actually uncovering new areas. Now, in the first game, that was not the problem. And the reason why I say problem is because one of the reasons why gunplay was actually satisfying in the first game was that you actually had access to the entire map, and the only thing you were uncovering was the enemies and where they're located on the map. So being able to actually line up your shot and see them from a distance was actually a way to circumvent the fact that the draw distance in this game is actually not as good as it could possibly be. Again, this is on the Sega Genesis and they had to make a lot of compromises to make this work. Again, the video display buffer for the first person 3D engine is truncated to a fraction of the screen, which initially is not terribly that big of a problem, but when it comes down to the shooting gameplay, it could be problematic, potentially. So the way they circumvented this in the first game was to basically make this dynamically refreshing map that already has the map revealed on it. Now, they've obviously changed this, so that way you have to dynamically explore the map for it to appear on the mini-map and refresh automatically. That makes the game a lot more tough. It's much more difficult. Also, you notice that the flashlight, like all the other items, they are not toggled items, they're automatic usage uh, sort of deals. So, basically, once the flashlight is collected, it slowly runs out. So, I kind of just wasted the flashlight, but that's okay, because this area is pretty well lit. I don't have to worry about darkness that much, so. Now, I'm going to warn you guys, I might die a lot in this playthrough, and that's because this game is actually extremely difficult. Uh, because they did not ramp, they did not change the, they did not change the difficulty at all to reflect the fact that this is just a prototype. So I'm gonna try my best. However, it might not be enough. I'm sad to say. Yeah, this is kind of echoing my previous playthrough of this game. And that's kind of a problem with this prototype. It's insane how difficult it is. It's actually really staggering. And borderline humbling, but not in the right way, because there are a few problems with this game that make it kind of tough to play. So you would think that they would not make the game really all that difficult, but I guess they were trying to ramp that element up as well. And, the, you know, the reason why gunplay and just traversing the environment is initially difficult in this game is that 
this engine's not stable just yet. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of carcasses and entities that are kind of flooding this environment right now. And because of that, the frame rate is it's staggering because of all these entities that are taking up the space. Like, as you can see right now, I can rotate the camera pretty quickly. But as soon as I reveal all these carcasses right here, uh, the frame rate takes a dive, and it really messes with rotating the camera. Also, you notice that the gun that I'm wielding does not make any noise. Of course, enemies do make noise. <sighs> Gotta take these guys out real quick. It's a feature that I actually want to describe in more detail. Let me take this guy out and maybe I can sh oh, goodness gracious. This game's not easy, folks. <laughs> okay. So, here we have something that appears to be a simple wall texture. Actually, believe it or not, this is, I guess, a cage that's, that's housing two alien robots. Now, if you leave them alone, they're not going to do anything. And let's see if they open up if you touch it. No? Okay, so just colliding with it with your character model doesn't do anything. However, if you accidentally shoot it during a firefight, it can turn a regular firefight that is under your control to a world, like a maelstrom of... <laughs> it, it turns the situation pear-shaped in an instant. So the thing that I do is just... I shoot it and engage these guys and alert them to my presence so I can take them out and just wash my hands of the situation. Now because of the existence of these, basically these cages, these monsters in the closet, it's actually really tough to kind of rush through the levels. You literally have to turn the corner and assess that part of the area. Like, oh shoot, there's guys here. Okay. Well, I guess I got to take these guys out first. Something that you guys will notice if you guys watched the Proto Watch, or not the Proto Watch, but the the Quick Look video I did on the first Zero Tolerance is that the enemies and your own character they kind of moved around like they were on soap, like they kind of slid to a stop. They fixed it for the enemies, and that's the good news. The bad news is they didn't fix it for the player character. So turning the camera and, and, and running and trying to come to a stop to change direction in terms of where you're walking, it's just it's still as problematic as it was in the first game. And the fact that the enemies do not abide by these movement quirks kind of adds to the fact that this prototype is not really tilted in the player's favor but not out of challenge but it's for the right it's for the wrong reason so again it's a prototype but man is it a tough son of a gun you guys might notice that my ammunition reserves are not plentiful and that's kind of how it's been every time I've played this this prototype of a game ammunition's really hard to come by only occasionally will you find caches of, of guns and ammunition and I guess the reason for that was they were just focusing mostly on level design and how to utilize it in certain you know certain situations or permutations and one of the things that I guess they were proud of were <laughs> the are the monsters in the closet sort of thing which again it's a great idea but man I would have loved for there to be more guns just more guns littered throughout the environment and like the first zero tolerance enemies will drop guns when they die they'll drop ammunition but if you do not get to them fast enough they eventually disappear and I think it only takes like 20 seconds to half a minute for this to happen but in an action-packed firefight the first thing you're worried about is staying alive I mean look at my health counter I've got seven hit points left and I'm sure to die within the next two encounters. It's just, it's going to happen. <sighs> See, right there. Boom. I'm dead. Alright. Who's next? 
Oh, this is a great chance for me to show you this. If you guys notice, when you access a new member and you get dropped back into the the level, they don't put you at the beginning of the level. No, they spawn you right where you last died. This is not a good decision to have <laughs> in a game. Especially when, think about this, you could have been in a huge firefight with multiple enemies. I mean, possibly 10 plus enemies. Let's say you just accidentally shot open three monsters in the monster closets and you're already facing three in intermediate enemies. Every time you get dropped right back into the action, you're in the thick of it right off the bat. And you possibly don't have enough ammunition from the outset as, as you spawn to take care of the situation. I've run into this situation a bunch of times. And it's a pain in the butt. If you guys notice, the draw distance is actually not that great in this prototype. I think because they were trying so many things that they couldn't they couldn't increase the draw distance to how it was in the first zero tolerance and have, I guess, a manageable frame rate. I don't know if I could call this necessarily manageable, but I guess it's still it it's it borders on the line of playability. In some cases, it's playable. In other cases, when you have a lot of enemies on screen and deceased enemies and carcasses and stuff, it's still kind of, Yeah, oh goodness, see? I think even by making noise, you can, you can have these robots jettison. And I'm already getting my butt kicked. Yeah, I've been in a situation where I've gone into a room that's had multiple mon monster closets. And... Just because of the frantic pace of the firefight, I think I shot all three of them with my first three shots. I think they went through the enemies, killing them, and then hitting the monster closets. And then all of a sudden I went from having no enemies to have to deal with to having ten plus enemies. And there's just still this quirk when, whenever you get hit, it makes you fall to the ground. Here's another monster closet. I just you have no choice but to take care of these things because if you just make a noise, they they will be alerted to your presence and they'll dispatch. So, I can't stress enough how much I am trying to be good at this game, but it's at every turn there's just a monkey in the wrench. The odd thing about this prototype is, as you go deeper into the mothership, the enemies actually get easier. I'm not sure as to why this is. I will say that they have actually improved the, I guess, the quality of the textures. And there's more, there's more of a breadth of how many textures that can be put on the wall uh, exist in this, this prototype. And there's some interesting effects that they do in terms of the environmental effects that I really want to show you guys. That is, if I can survive. Oh, that. Okay, let's let's look at that again. Hmm. Did you guys see that? There was a glitch. The way this game stacks levels is it's kind of a smoke and mirrors act. Uh, between some of the elevators, this smooth transition will not actually happen. And you can see that my position, my lateral position changed. The reason why that is is because I'm being teleported to a different map. See? Right there. That wasn't the video capture right there. That was actually the game itself. Yep. It just teleported me to a new position. So they hadn't really ironed that whole smoke and mirrors act down yet. They definitely had it down in the first game. I actually thought that the engine was true 3D when they were just doing a build engine sort of smoke and mirrors act to make it look like you were still within that environment when in reality you're just hitting a transitional point to be teleported to a new floor and then be given the illusion because of the dropping elevation of that floor that you're actually still in that same elevator 
when it's just the exact same thing duplicated. Thus giving you the illusion that the engine's stacking floors when it's really not. But anyway, let's get back into the thick of the action. Now you can still run in this game, it's the same way it was in the first ZT where you actually have to build up momentum by holding down forward on the D-pad. For those of you guys wondering how I'm doing this, I'm actually emulating this game because it's really the only way this would be possible. I actually downloaded the Beyond Zero Tolerance ROM which is publicly available at this point. It's freeware. They actually released it on the official Technopop website. That's the company that actually developed this game. Accolade is the company that published it. Published it, sorry. And um, before I actually explain the rest of that, check out this cool environmental effect. They actually, this is actually the outdoor environment. This is the, I guess, the wall canvas that uh, was this is a feature used in a lot of FPS games to give the illusion of being in an out or being out doors when in reality you're kind of just in a glorified corridor or small close quartered environment and it was just a way for FPS game designers to show some sort of illusion of freedom and with this game there's no exception you actually do feel like you're on a floating spaceship with this effect and this is actually not a wall texture if well it half is half isn't if you look closely you'll notice that this texture the the actual vines or the tentacles or whatever these these blinds are over the the window that's the actual texture but the wall canvas or the wall mural that's actually outside it literally is outside of the environment I don't know why but I find that so fascinating that they were able to pull that off and there's another enemy okay yeah this I mean this game along with the first zero tolerance I mean it just does the first game actually came out in 1994 for the Genesis alone. It, it was never ported to PC. It was a game specifically designed to... Oh, goodness gracious. Why aren't you letting me talk about your series? Thank you. Thank you for dying. I appreciate that. It was a game designed specifically to run only on the Genesis. And I find that so fascinating because not only does the game work right, it, does, it has a lot of aesthetic touches to it that actually that actually were never seen on PC FPS games the notion of blood decals animations for the corpses sometimes when you kill an enemy they'll twitch before they die that sort of element was not even shown in an FPS game on the PC until Duke Nukem 3D two years after Zero Tolerance first came out I just find it so staggering how how much quality is in the first game it's just it's unbelievable now obviously the the quality of this prototype is debatable but then again i assume that this game was only 60 percent complete and because of that this game does lack a lot of polish and that's unfor oh goodness that's unfortunate but at the same time if they were given more time and they were actually given a chance to finish the game, I think it would have been pretty impressive. Now, like I said, there are some elements of this game that are impressive, like these monster closets are actually kind of cool. I've never really seen that in a PC FPS. I mean, obviously you've seen it in Doom. They do it in a more interesting way, I suppose, but the fact that they're using wall textures to, to I guess, rot new aesthetic concepts and gameplay concepts working within limitations while still doing interesting things with the tools at their disposal granted they're limited I just find very impressive uh, and very admirable that they were able to just crank out this these sort of ideas and just make it work within the confines of stock Genesis hardware again this is a game that 
it's a game that I respect. And I'm talking about the first Zero Tolerance. I have a lot of respect for that game. Not just because it's fun. I mean, obviously that's up for debate. There have been a lot of people that said that that game is not terribly good. But I would beg to differ with that. Because, oh, that's great. Dead again. I told you guys this was going to happen. And uh, I apologize again, but this is actually an extremely difficult prototype to play through. Mm. Can I get some ammo? Can I get some ammo? Thank you. Okay. Now, for those of you who actually played Zero Tolerance or have watched my quick look video, you'll notice that the arsenal of weapons at my disposal is actually a lot different than the first game. So even though I say this game was roughly 60% complete, I only mean in terms of, I guess, final polish. And the reason why I say that is because there's still a lot of change made in from this prototype when compared to the first game. They change quite a lot. The location's completely different. The environment's different. The different nuances with the environments are completely different. The arsenal's different. It's just... I wouldn't call it a total conversion because there are some concepts in this game that are just not seen in the first Zero Tolerance. And Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's almost completely unfair how much of an advantage the enemy has against you when it comes to mo their mobility and their accuracy. This is a game that actually does not use aim assist. Oh goodness. There's no absolutely no aim assist in the game whatsoever and that's kinda why hitting your mark is extremely difficult. It's also hard to tell whether or not I'm hitting an enemy because they're not making any sort of noise and the gunplay admittedly is not all that satisfying because I can't hear any gunshots so Let's just alert these guys so that we can be done and over with. Oh, goodness gracious. God, they hit hard. But the aesthetics of the environmental design, the color palette, it's pretty unique. It's not just unique in terms of its departure from the first zero tolerance, but it's just unique because you never really... You wouldn't see a color palette like this for an environment until... I guess the first Halo. First Halo did a lot of things with purples and violets and blues and stuff like that. And I... Okay. Whoa, I thought I was going to die for a sec. I'm going to plan this out. I'm going to plan this out. I don't know if that... Oh, well, I, I killed them, but not before they killed me. Alright, here we go. I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but... Again, trying to be as informative as possible with describing how this game works. I know it's really... It's really tough for me just because the game is just so extremely difficult. But, I mean, that feature, I mean, that's a that's a cool little feature, I think. That they get deployed out of these cages. These little frames that they're housed inside of. It's just a, a smart little touch that they threw in the game. And just like the first ZT, the arsenal has guns, it has explosives of different types that can be used in various ways. And, you know, just like the first Zero Tolerance, there are physics attached to them. Like, for example, let me throw this grenade. Oh, gosh, I'm going to die. Whew. Well, it actually knocked me back. Oh, it was because... Oh. Whoa. That was actually pretty interesting. I've actually never experienced that before. So, apparently, when you throw explosives and stuff, and they're in close proximity to the enemies... It'll actually kind of blow some giblets out of them. Interesting. Like I said, I haven't played through the entirety of this prototype, but 
I've played through a great deal of it to see all the various nuances that it has. I'm still uncovering stuff, of course, as you can see, but I hope you guys are getting as much of the full picture as possible. Oh, goodness gracious. Again, blood decals. I could watch that for hours. I just think that's such an impressive technical feature that, again, this game was slated for, from what I understand, a 1995 release. That's still a good year before the seminal release of Duke Nukem 3D. I actually kind of find it criminal that the first Zero Tolerance did not get as much attention as I personally think it deserved. It just did a lot of interesting things. The environments were kind of cool. I thought the stuff they did with the out, the exterior environments was very impressive for the time. And this game seems to be no exception. I think the most impressive thing about this game is that it theoretically is running on Sega Genesis hardware, not the PC. I just find it so interesting to play games that punch way above their weight. And when it succeeds in a weight class that it doesn't belong in, I mean, it's just, man, it's impressive. And it's impressive for reasons that are hard for me to articulate. For example, Shadow Squadron, that's a perfect example of a game that a space combat flight game in full 3D on a 32X. I mean, who who honestly had that ambition? But I dare say that it's important that you have developers out there that do punch above their weight when making software for specific hardware. I mean, it keeps things interesting. There's, like, for example, there's a game called Warlocked. With, it's War Locked with an apostrophe and a D at, at the end. Like, the old world locked. Just like trapped. The old world way to spell trapped. It's a real-time strategy game for the Game Boy. Like, what kind of ambition does a developer have to have to think that they can make that sort of game work on that particular hardware? Extremely limited. A lot of people think that it's limited to make an RTS experience for a home console. But making it for a portable that has only four face buttons and a D-pad? It's... It's insane, but apparently the game works perfectly fine. In fact, it's actually a solid game from what I've played of it. Unfortunately, I can't necessarily put that kind of stamp on this prototype. Then again, it's only a prototype, and I can't really criticize it. I'm only criticizing it because it's, it makes it really difficult for me to kind of con convey to you guys as I'm getting my butt handed to me. It makes it hard for me to convey to you guys how the prototype works because I have to survive this onslaught while still keeping this <laughs> regulated to, to a, an intellectual basis. Let's see, this looks like it's another elevator. And it is. Though this prototype does have some clear flaws, I think that these issues would have been ironed out had they been given the opportunity to take this later into development, given more time to polish things further. They would have polished out the difficulty. They would have fixed the movement for the, char the player character to reflect the movement mechanics of the enemies also. I think they just didn't get to that point. I think they were working more. It's clear that this game... This prototype was concentrating more heavily on enemy design, enemy movement, enemy AI, and its interaction with the environment, 
not only in terms of how it traverses the environment and follows the, you know tries to catch up with you and combat you but I think they were also trying to concentrate on the engine itself so I'm sure on the back burner it was it was stuff like the sound effects the music hopefully they're thinking of making more music tracks for the levels because that's one thing that's kind of scant in the first game they're not terrible music tracks there's just not enough of them I feel nothing that really detracts from the game it's just something that's just, it's just a nitpicking thing but as you can tell they're recycling a lot of the sound effects from the first game in fact I don't think there are any brand new sound effects I haven't heard any thus far wonder if that's a destructible the first game does have destructible environments so I'm not sure if this oh wow okay so the game has destructible environments like straight up destructible environments that's that's actually really impressive I still I can't believe that I'm still finding out new things about this game let's try that again because that's whoa Nelly oh good oh god oh god oh oh wow Um, uh, hmm. Uh, this is a tough call to make. You know what? I'm gonna go for broke. Alright. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna have to pause the recitation for a second. I'm gonna have to do some I'm gonna have to do some some cleaning up come on hopefully you guys hopefully my babies made their mark nice okay here's something that is kind of okay it's a great feature but again, it's something that does not tilt the game in your favor. When you're using stuff like grenades and rocket launchers to kill enemies, thank goodness it does enough damage to kill them outright, even with splash damage. And splash damage is does not discriminate between the enemy and the player. So, for example, here, let me switch to my grenade. This is actually going to hurt me, but... Okay, I'm just going to throw this. That knocked me back. And the only reason why I did not get injured is because I have body armor. So, the way explosives work in this game is actually kind of realistic um, when you think about it. You throw a grenade, and you really need to run. And that's really how you're gonna. That's how you're gonna prevent getting damaged, because you're not, you're not able to throw it far enough. You actually have to throw it and run. And I guess that's how real life works. <laughs> now, if you're running while you throw it, you will huck it farther, but you're still going to get some minimal da- Oh, goodness. God, that's awesome. Now, if you notice, there's nothing left of those enemies. So the weapons that they pick up, not only do the enemies get vaporized, but so do their weapons. So... In a game that is already scant in terms of weapon pickups, it's not really encouraged as much to dispatch your enemies with explosive weapons. Only if you're in a serious pinch and you manage to, I guess, you want to clear out most of the enemies, you want to vaporize most of them, but I guess the aim with explosive weapons is you want to vaporize a good portion of the enemies hopefully majority of them and then the stragglers that are caught within the splash damage of the explosive whether it be from a rocket launcher 
or from a grenade, those are the enemies that you're going to be able to pick their weapons up from. The ones that are vaporized, you're just, you're SOL, you're out of luck. You guys will no also notice some pop-in with some of these wall textures. And again, that's, that's all trumped up to the instability of the engine at this point in time. I think had they been given more time, te the Technopop team would have definitely, they definitely would have cleaned some of this stuff up. Because there's some, there's some walls that you see right here. There's some walls that, actually that's not a good example because that's actually a, an entry point in a room. There's, as you can see as I'm rotating the camera, some of the wall textures are blacking out and dis straight up disappearing. That's an engine instability issue and I'm sure they would have cleaned that up with more time. And that's really the crux of this sort of review or synopsis or breakdown of Beyond Zero Tolerance is that the game's just not really all that stable. I'm sure if I'd seen a prototype of the first Zero Tolerance, it would have been the same deal. It probably would have been extremely unstable, would have ran at a variable frame rate that would dip down to unplayable levels with a lot of characters in the environment at one time, and would have terrible pop-in, and mechanics that are not tilted within the, the favor of the player. So, to a degree where it's difficult to a fault. Nice, that was a good crack shot I pulled off right there. That's never going to happen again, I assume. Oh my goodness, I spoke way soon, too. Speak of the devil. Oh goodness, enemies are coming in behind me. Oh man. That's how situations can turn pear-shaped in an instant. And it was only because I was wearing body armor that I survived that, which is now at 40%. So... That was... That was rough. Wow, my rifles actually got almost... Inf almost... Top capacity when it comes to ammunition. Hmm. I've actually never done quite this well during a playthrough of Beyond Zero Tolerance, so... This is actually quite a momentous occasion. Okay, so now you can see that I have most of the map revealed. You can tell that I'm actually able to scroll through it. Again, my the, the direction in which the character is facing is not shown on this map, but that's not necessarily the point. You can see that with the mini-map easily enough. I do like the aesthetics of the graphics, though. I, I really do like the art style of it. It's just different. I, I The whole lavender and... and maroon and stuff like that. Never really seen that in a, in a game before. Oh, I have seen it in a game since, but before this game, no. Or at least as far as FPS games go. It's a shame they never tried to port this to PC. I feel like it would have done much better. They could have increased the FOV. They could have increased the size of the graphics display buffer. They certainly could have fixed a lot of things, but or they could have improved upon a lot of things. Because I don't think the games, I don't think the first game is necessarily bad. It definitely is hampered by the limitations of the Genesis hardware, though. Nice. Wow, I'm doing a lot better than I have done in playthroughs playthroughs past. Go to this area over here. I will say this about the format in which they've kind of laid everything out with the inventory and stuff. Cool thing about this is actually a good change that they made to the game. If you notice, the bulletproof vest takes up one of the three inventory slots on the right side of my map display. It does not take up a spot on the inventory display above my view screen like it did in the first Zero Tolerance. 
this is actually an important change that they made. And I say that because there was actually a desperate struggle with inventory management. You could have a flashlight, a bulletproof vest, and a nav map, and you'd only be able to have three weapons in your arsenal because those took up a spot on this top inventory uh, screen, subscreen. That was actually a painful sacrifice. So the fact that they switched it up to, I guess, non-combat items being used up by these three auxiliary slots, that is an important change to make. And I'm glad they made it. Because now my, my main weapon inventory can be filled up with just weapons. Oh. That's a weird glitch. It just... I just appeared on the next floor. Huh. By the way, a little trivia for you guys. If you look at the ID card and you look to the left, just to the left of the mugshot, that logo with the upside down triangle and the three orbs, that's actually the logo for the company that developed this game, Technopop. They also maintain the laser sighting. I like how the laser dot gets bigger as you as, as your weapon gets closer to the wall. As the distance becomes greater, the laser becomes the laser dot becomes smaller. There's a lot of neat ideas in this game, and the first one as well. Okay, I actually do not need that. Surprisingly enough, I will soon, I'm sure. Goodness. Now, here's a feature that I didn't really use all that much, just because it's hard to move around when you're crouched, or when you're prone. But when you're prone, you actually do more damage with every shot that you, that you fire off. Again, it's something that is hard to pull off, because you are moving at a snail's pace when you're crouching. So, it's something I only advise if you have a, a very good beat on the enemy. If you do not, I don't advise it. Now camera rotation works just fine when you're crouched, but it's just the fact that you strafe and you walk forward and backpedal at such a slow pace, it's almost not worth it in most cases. Like I said, only if you've got a beat on several enemies that are almost directly in front of your FOV. That's really the only occasion in which crouching to fire your weapon actually is more suitable and preferable. Ooh, here's a monster closet right here. Nice. See, I feel more confident now that I have a lot more ammo to work with. It's only in the beginning of the prototype where you just don't have a lot of ammunition at your disposal that you become more conservative with your shots and because of that you have reservations about firing off a shot and as a result the enemy always gets a better shot on you so that's it's kind of a catch-22 you don't want to waste the ammo but you don't want to obviously you don't want the enemy to get the first shot in okay let's Okay, that's actually not destructible. No, that's got to be destructible. Alright, let's see if I can ricochet this off the wall. Hmm, no, didn't work out that well. Well, that took out the enemy, if you look at the mini-map. Huh, interesting. It must have been right in the crevice where the, the corners of the wall blocks meet, I guess. If you're thinking about, like, Wolf 3D logic. <laughs> oh, gosh, this pop-in. I want to go further north.
Whoa. Okay. So I'm actually coming up on the 50 minute mark. So I'm gonna kind of negotiate these next few areas and then are you guys actually not going to huh that's very interesting they appear to be like one frame before they dispatch or pop out they're not popping out why is that it's interesting well There we go. Oh, goodness. It's also a very funky white outline. You can see right there around the the sprites of the enemies. I guess the, that's another aspect of this game. The enemy sprites were not cleaned up terribly well. But then again, it is just a, an alpha build. And I have to assume that this was kind of a total conversion sort of deal where they took basically the chunk of data that was zero tolerance and they just started making changes to it I mean why wouldn't they do that that's usually what they do with engines mm. oh that's not oh, that was not smart on my part oh goodness gracious It's unfair how much of an advantage the enemy has. I do like how the robot aliens actually twist their guns sideways like gangsta style before they pop a shot off. It's a good little indicator that they're about to, to fire at you. And I think it's kind of hilarious that they do that. They, they dump sideways whenever they fire their weapons. Like Latin King style or something like that. <laughs> Bull crap that is. Oh goodness, the slowdown is just out of control right now. I'm like I'm pressing so hard left to turn. Oh, there's some popping right there. It's weird, some of these enemy sprites do not have outlines around them, like awkward chroma key outlines around them. And some of them do. do this. This kind of reminds me of Catacomb Abyss 3D just because the colors are so saturated. How many of you guys remember playing that game? If you do, be sure to comment. Oh, let's take this guy out. Wait. God, where is he coming from? Oh, he's coming from a distance. Oh no, there's a guy dumping sideways on me over there. Oh. All right, there goes my bulletproof vest. Place your bets, folks. Oh, goodness, this is not going to end well. All right, if I die, this is going to pretty much conclude the episode, so... Oh, goodness, that was close. You see that? He held up his hand. He's about to dump sideways. Got some grenades. Oh, God, jeez. So as you can see, this game is an interesting artifact, and just like the first ZT, or Zero Tolerance, it's an interesting cul-de-sac in the world of FPS gaming, and just an interesting footnote in the genre. It's, it's just weird that these games exist, but they do, and the first one works impeccably well. The second one, not so much, but again, it's not finished, and uh, chances are it never will be, so... I know it seems like a sour note to end on, but I don't think so. I think it's uh, 
it's definitely a game that I want to put more time into. And like I said at the beginning of this video, the multiplayer aspect of it is so fascinating just because if I could get it running using an EverDrive cartridge, two of them to be exact because you need two si you need two systems and two games to make this work, it would be kind of fascinating to play some cooperative zero tolerance or beyond zero tolerance for that matter. Because the way that this thing works and the way it's balanced against the player, it seems like it would be more feasible to tackle this sort of challenge with two people. So, anyway, I'm so sorry, Kirsten. I love your name, though. love that name. It's a nice name. I would play on, but I'm burning daylight. And uh, I've got a lot of other stuff that I need to do for the Solid State Gamer reviews and uh, doing the podcast. So I'm going to end it right here. And I'm just going to say thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys found this video to be informative. And if you guys were ever curious about this game, uh, I hope this shed more light on what it's all about and what makes it tick. It definitely has a lot of interesting concepts and ideas and... The aesthetics are also pretty fascinating for this game and how they culminate into the gameplay. Like I said, using the monster closets as wall textures that animate and then eventually spawn enemies kind of gauntlet style. A lot of neat ideas in this prototype. Again, it has issues, but at the same time, it's, it's not a finished work. And it shouldn't be judged, it should not be judged as such. So I will not. Uh, it just made it really difficult for me to convey all the different nuances in the prototype to you guys who are watching. So, But anyway, that pretty much concludes this Proto Watch for Beyond Zero Tolerance. I hope you guys enjoyed, and see you guys next time.